In the third chapter of St. Luke, the scripture says, After all the people had been baptized, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, heaven opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And then the very next chapter, the very beginning of the fourth chapter, the scripture says, Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. This has been an image in a scripture that I've prayed a lot about over the years, this, this idea of the Holy Spirit leading Jesus to the desert. I mean, we find in that text that Jesus in the Jordan, the, the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit falls upon him and fills him. And, and the Lord is pleased with him. And then the very next scripture is, is Jesus being uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and then being led out into the desert by the Holy Spirit. Mark actually uses stronger words. St. Mark says uh, that, that, that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus to the desert. The desert that Jesus went to was called the devastation. Uh, I mean, the desert, the whole idea of desert uh, brings about all kinds of images for us, but that was particularly true for the people of Israel because the people in Israel, the desert represented in, in some ways everything that went wrong. I mean, the desert was the place of defeat. Um, the desert was a place of isolation. The desert was the place of their unfaithfulness. There's just that powerful scripture in, in the Old Testament when, when symbolically once a year, the Day of Atonement, they would bring the, the, the lambs and they would symbolically place the blood of a lamb on the lamb and, and head it out to the desert and symbolically the Lamb of God huh, would take away the sins to the desert. I mean, the desert, a place of death and barrenness. So the Holy Spirit leads Jesus to the desert, almost as if to say, um, it's going to be different. The place of all the mistakes, the place where things went terribly wrong, I'm going to change that. I'm going to make it new. That the desert is going to be different because the Holy Spirit leads Jesus to the desert. I mean, there's just so many beautiful, great images that we can reflect on. And first is the obvious, that the, that the evil one tempts Jesus to the, in the desert. It's important for us to think about that, that, that it wasn't the Holy Spirit that tempted Jesus. The Holy Spirit empowered Jesus and led him to the desert. But it was the seducer. It was the evil one. It was Satan that tempts Jesus. And the other thing that's, that's important, I think, for us to remember is that is that the Holy Spirit, the evil one didn't necessarily tempt Jesus towards his weakness. I think sometimes we think about that, but Jesus had been in the desert for 40 days and he was hungry. So what does the evil one do? He says, make this rock loaves of bread. He doesn't, he doesn't tempt Jesus in his weakness. Rather, he tempts us in our vulnerability. Jesus was hungry. I mean, he'd been fasting for 40 days. And the evil one has said in that, in that vulnerability, in that hunger, uh, make these rocks bread. I think there's something for us to be able to reflect on and, and that oftentimes what the evil one is going to do when he comes and he tries to tempt us, he's going to try to figure out where we're vulnerable and go after that. If we're lonely, he's going to tempt us there. If we're angry, he's going to tempt us there. If we're hungry, he's going to tempt us there. If we're bored, he, he figures out our vulnerabilities and he tempts us there. But Jesus coming into the desert, there's a victory in that, that, that we realize we don't have to give in to the temptation, temptations, that Jesus radically changes the desert and the idea of being tempted. And he shows us that it doesn't have to be a place of defeat. Rather, the desert can actually be a place of victory. By senior year, I was, I was pretty gone. I didn't uh, care about anything, just wanted to party and had no faith at all. Um, a lot of it in my life, I had a lot of anxiety growing up, so I had terrible panic attacks. Uh, growing up and I really blamed God for it big time. I remember praying and asking God to remove this from me and give me another disease, you know. I couldn't go places, I'd freak out all the time. You know, and I remember before the new translation of, of the Mass, there was that part um, in I think the Eucharistic prayer and it was like, deliver us from all anxiety. You know, I'm like, well, what the heck, man? Like, where is that deliverance? You know, I wasn't seeing it. Um, so I blamed God a lot for that. I used drugs a lot to, to escape that. And then, you know, the girls and the women all kind of come with that and just perversion and um, just lust and, and selfishness. And that's what I lived. The other image that comes to my mind about the desert is that the desert is, is a place of desolation. 
I, anybody who's been walking with the Lord with any, any length of time knows that, that there are times in the spiritual life that, that are desolate, they're, they're barren. And I always laugh, a, a friend of mine was a great, great musician and she wrote a song when she was about 16 years old. And one of the lines is, I've been walking this road so long, it's dry, it's lonely, I'm tired, and, and I'm just kind of chuckling. Okay, a 16 year old, you've been walking this a long road. But, but the reality is, is that as we walk the spiritual life, that there is times of desolation. I, I think of my own life. I remember when I was in seminary, it was just really, a, there was a couple of years that was just a really difficult time. And, and one of the more particularly difficult times was when I was working at Children's Hospital. I spent about, I don't know, about 12 or 14 weeks working at the Children's Hospital. And it was just a, it was a profound experience in my life. I was working in the neonatal intensive care. And, and during that summer, I don't know, we, I had something like 20, 21 babies that died. And, and to be with a mom and dad who were holding their little baby that just died. And they look at me and they say, why did this just happen? I mean, what do you say? I mean, what kind of answer are you going to be able to give them that's going to be able to make any sense at all? And for me during that time, it was just, it was this great time of desolation. I remember writing in my journal one time, I said, God, you seem like a stranger I once knew. It was as if, it was as if Jesus was distant and, and nothing, nothing fed my soul. I mean, I would go to mass and it seemed so empty and I would go to prayer and it seemed so empty. And for a seminarian who was about to be a priest, this was, this was really confusing for me. And, and I didn't know what to do. It was, it was as if this fog just kind of covered me and, and I couldn't see God anywhere. And it was a Thursday evening and, and the Lord just broke in. And I heard the Lord say to me, Dave, don't you know that I love you? And at that moment, it was kind of funny because I said, okay, Lord, I know that you love me, but the real issue is here. And let me explain to you all the real issues. I mean, what am I supposed to do when a young mother is holding her baby and the baby's died? And, and I just go through this big list of what the issues are. And the Lord patiently waited me to go through that. And, and then he just said, Dave, don't you know that I love you? And I think at that moment, I, I, I guess I had forgotten that. And, and I just began to kind of pray and I said, Lord, if you would just lift this fog so that I can see you, so that you don't seem so foreign and, and so, so distant. And I heard the Lord say to me, Dave, don't you know that I'm in the middle of that fog? I was going to a party, you know, had some drugs with me and I could still see it today. I look in, in my rear view mirror and boom, like the lights go on. This cop pulls me over and, you know, puts me in the back of this cop car. And all this stuff starts to go through my head, like all, all my friends telling me like, dude, it's just weed, it's just drinking, it's just parties, this is what you do in high school. There's no God, there's no faith, this stuff is corrupt, you know, and all these things started going through my head and I just started to, to question it and I was like, is this really what I want my life to be? You know, is this really what I want my existence to be? And I, and I really believe in that moment, I knew God was going to change my life. There's something in that moment, I was like, God's going to change my life. For me specifically, the, the void in my heart was coming from a broken home. I knew my mom loved me, I knew my dad loved me. They did a great job of showing us that, but though we weren't together anymore, I felt this void. And so it felt like from you know those seven years since they had gotten divorced, I felt like just something's not right. And nothing was filling that void or answering that. And when I was in eighth grade, I had a friend invite me to a retreat, to come on a retreat. And um, I remember saying, sure, like I'd, I'd totally, I'd love to go. And I had heard about the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know like that he could have an active role in my life. And so someone gave a talk Saturday night about a life in the Spirit, about just living life with the Holy Spirit. And they were like, if you've never prayed for this outpouring before and you want it, come forward. And I was like, I've never prayed for it, I want it, so I have to come forward, I can't lie, you know? Like, so I went forward. And that right there was a changing moment. I thought that the fog was gonna have to lift so that I would be able to see the Lord, but that wasn't the case, that, that the Lord was there in the midst of the desolation, in the midst of where are you, God? that I just wasn't able to see him and I wasn't able to recognize him. And, and when he broke into my heart and, and, and reminded me of his love, it, it just changed everything. It wasn't a desolation, but even in that feeling of, 
of absence. I don't know how to explain it, but but that God was present, that that that, that was redeemed and. And so oftentimes we, we fear the desert and we don't want to go there. But the reality is, is if we allow that, if we allow the Spirit to lead us there, we experience God in a manner, in a way that we can't anywhere else, that, that we don't anywhere else. There was like that just still voice in my heart just saying like, why not now? Why not now? And so when he asked for us to come forward, it was like, all right, Lord, like maybe you're gonna fill this hole in my heart of a broken family. And maybe you're gonna bring your spirit into that and, and help me move through this pain. When I went off to college, uh, my first philosophy class, uh, the professor said, God's dead. And uh, I, I began to wrestle with uh, the, the whole uh, experience that I had had and uh, began to question whether even God existed. And uh, at that point, I just began to um, look to the world, uh, rely on my own strengths, and uh, uh, felt that it was dependent on me. I wanted to be king of the world. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, started working very hard uh, to, to acquire material um, goods. And uh, every time I thought that I was uh, uh, working towards something, I, I felt like, uh, I, I felt a passion uh, to get that new house, to get that new car, uh, and uh, to succeed at my firm, that next conference uh, to speak at. Uh, and every time there was this emptiness, and uh, I, I felt that, uh, well, maybe it's that next big thing, and uh, never was arriving at a level of satisfaction uh, in, in acquiring uh, material wealth. The other, the other image that I like to reflect on in the desert is, is just this place of isolation. I mean, there, there's an aloneness that's out here. And there's, that's the part of the reason, I'm sure, that Jesus is, goes to the desert to become alone. But, but it reminds us something significant in the spiritual life. And that is that, that there are times in our life that, that, that we are lonely, that, that that's a part of the way that we've been created. Is, is that there's an emptiness inside my heart and only the Lord can feel it. There's an emptiness in you that we try to satisfy it with other things and stuff and with, with jobs or activities or recreation or entertainment and all of that kind of stuff. But this loneliness and this emptiness is actually put there by God. It's the way we've been created. There's a difference between loneliness and isolation. Loneliness is created, there's a part of us that's lonely that is created by God. And whenever we experience that loneliness, that's always an invitation to the Lord. If there's ever a moment that, that we feel like empty or lonely, that, brothers and sisters, is an invitation to allow God to fill that. Compare that with isolation. I, isolation is damaging. Isolation uh, separates us from people and from relationships. Loneliness is a part of life. Loneliness is, I love this image, it's, it's, it's the new father whose wife has just had a baby and he goes home that night and he leaves his newborn son and his wife at the hospital and he goes home that night and the house is empty and he's lonely, huh? And that is an invitation to God. The desert reminds us of, of the loneliness and, 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 and the quiet and the stillness. And yet, so oftentimes we try to fill it with busyness and we don't like that, that feeling of loneliness. And, we try to satisfy it, and, and sometimes we need to be able to come to the desert, be led by the Spirit to the desert, and wrestle with that loneliness, wrestle with that emptiness, and, and allow the Lord to fill that. The, the first things that began to happen, um, my father died, Terry's father died. Uh, her mother had uh, a debilitating disease uh, Terry had a miscarriage. And in that year, we, we really began to wrestle uh, with, with uh, grief. And uh, I didn't have anything to, to really f help me through that grieving period. Um, when my daughter was born, um, she was a very special gift. And uh, my daughter, Colleen. And for three years, uh, Right, right around age three to six, every night she wanted me to read one bedtime story for her. And that was the Bible. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> 
And uh, so I began to read these words that I had not read in, in many years. And uh, it, it began to soften my heart. Um, and and I, I felt like I needed something uh, to, to, be, to begin to fill this emptiness that uh, I could not fill with the world. Uh, the desert is a place of suffering. I, I love reflecting on the Old Testament when, again, when Moses leads the people to the desert and, and, the, and there's just a great image, okay, that God has led the people who were slaves out of slavery and, and, they're, and they're wandering through the desert. And, and we know the story because we've heard it many, many times, but the people are hungry and God miraculously feeds them, huh? Feeds them every morning with manna. And, and they get frustrated with that and they say, we're tired of this bread. They actually say, we wish we were slaves again. I mean, what a slap in the face of the Lord. The Lord leads them to freedom, uh, leads them from the power of the Pharaoh so that they're, they're, the people are once again being able to worship the Lord. And they say, we wish we were slaves again. So we know the story that, that, that the Lord sends the serpent and, and if the people are bitten by the serpent, um, they're going to die. And Moses goes before the people on behalf of the people before the Lord. And he says, Lord, we're sorry, and he repents. And, and the Lord says, okay, if they get bit by the serpent, take the serpent, mount it on a pole, and lift it up. And if they look at that, they'll be healed. What's remarkable about this text is, is that what God could have done, had he chosen to, he could have said, okay, no more serpents. You're not going to be bit. There's not going to be any suffering. But he doesn't do that. In the middle there, in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the desert, if they get bit by the serpent, raise it on a pole and look upon that and you'll be healed. That there's still going to be the suffering, there's still going to be the difficulty, but there's healing in that. So in the third chapter of John, when Jesus says, unless the Son of Man is lifted up, he's referring to this text, unless the Son of Man is lifted up. And we know that, 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 that takes us to the cross. That this desert, a desert is a place of suffering. And, in the reality that it's a part of the Christian life, that, that Jesus comes to the desert, the Spirit leads Jesus to the desert, the Spirit leads Jesus to the cross. It's a part of all of our journeys. And we spend so much time trying to get away from it. We don't want to go to the desert. We don't want to go to suffering. Who does? But sometimes the Spirit leads us. And I want to be where the Spirit is. Wherever the Spirit is, that's where I want to be. And if the Spirit desires to lead me into the desert, even though there may be times that it's difficult, I want to be where the Spirit leads me. Well, you know, I mean, you know the story about my son, Max. So with Max, you know, when he was born, he had pretty severe uh, difficulties. He had, you know, really horrible brain damage and he now has cerebral palsy. And I remember thinking like, feeling that was the farthest I ever was from God when he was first born. And it was just a common fallacy that everybody had that in our suffering, you know, that's when we're farthest from God. It wasn't until about three months later that I realized the closest I ever was to God was in that suffering because he suffered. And I know the whole time that the Holy Spirit was calling me through that, just saying, take another step, take another step, take another step, until I finally realized well, he was there the whole time, you know, he was there the whole time and, and I was ready to give up, you know, because I wasn't feeling what I wanted to feel. Uh, I wasn't feeling the good bubbly feelings that you, you know, you could, but uh, it was at that point now when I look back at my life, you know, my 30 years of life, the closest I was ever to the Lord was in that suffering. I remember one experience that I had when I was in Africa. I was with this bishop and, and the bishop asked me if I would pray uh, with a friend of his who was a priest, which, which I was very grateful to be able to do. And, and as it turns out, I, I, think, I think what he had was Lou Gehrig's disease. He was beginning to become paralyzed uh, from his extremities in. And by the time I met him, he could no longer walk. And, and we prayed with him for a while and, and nothing seemed to be happening. So I just asked the bishop and the other people I was with if I could just pray with the priest by myself. So it was just me and this priest, and, and he began to share with me how his life had changed, how his ministry had changed since he became sick. He said, you know, Father, I used to offer confessions and nobody comes, but now I'll offer confessions and people will line up to be able to come to confession. He said that the people in the parish said that I preach differently, that I have more empathy, that I have more compassion. He said, a year ago, the church was often half full and now it's, it's overflowing. 
You know, and I was just listening to this story and, and I was seeing how this man, this priest was being changed, but not just he being changed from his suffering, from the desert that the Lord was inviting him to walk through, but his people were being changed. There's a French theologian and he has a quote and it says, there are places in our heart which don't exist and into which suffering must enter so that they may. The desert changes us. The cross changes us. What Jesus does when he's led to the desert, what Jesus does when he goes to the cross, is he redeems this desert. It doesn't have to be just a place of death or a place of desolation or a place of temptation, but, and this is only grace, this is only by the power of God, but, but this can become a place of redemption. This can become a place of healing. This can actually become, in the, in the midst of this desolation, a place that we can discover God and He can find us. Brothers and sisters, if the Holy Spirit desires to lead us to the desert, that's where I want to be. And I want to be able to go wherever the Spirit leads. It was definitely frustration at first. I mean, that's what I came up against. And I think the other two sisters with whom I'm serving in this foreign land had the same experience of we just felt like we're hitting this brick wall. What is this, Lord? You know, you brought us here to evangelize and we're just kind of hitting, felt interiorly like we're hitting this brick wall. And I think what the Lord was, He wanted us to get to that point where He's saying, yeah, because you're still to some extent working on your own steam here. And so for me personally, I had to get to that point of frustration, like, why can't I do this? You know, the way I used to always be able to so easily, so naturally. Oh, so naturally. <laughs> that, that was the key when I realized I've been doing it naturally and He wants to do it supernaturally. Once I got so frustrated with my own inability, that's when I could humbly go before Him and say, okay, Lord, show me a new way. And that's scary, I think, um, because we are a very, we come from an independent society where, you know, we, we want a certain degree of competency, a certain degree of um, professionalism. That's all fine. But I think if we look back to the, the first apostles, you know, the early church, there was a certain degree of, this is crazy, what are we doing? You know, we, I'm not cut out for this. And I think that when we can get to that point in our own lives and realize, you know what? I thought I was cut out. <laughs> I see now that really, I'm not without Him. When we can begin to find Jesus in the midst of this desert, we can find Him anywhere. We bear in mind that as the scripture says, the Spirit led Jesus to the desert for 40 days. Sometimes we feel that, that this desert is going to go on forever, but it isn't. There are seasons. And I don't know how long it's going to be. I don't know how long your desert's going to be, but I know that you can find God there if you allow the Spirit to reveal that. And I know that it's a season and that the Lord will bring you through that. So what I would encourage you to do is, is to take a couple of minutes just to be quiet and to be still, maybe, maybe reflect, what is your thought about, about this, this being led to the, to the desert? What's your feeling when, when you pray about the reality that the Holy Spirit at times wants to lead you to the desert? Oftentimes that, that stirs up enough fear and anxiety. That's not of the Lord. If the Spirit's leading us, that's where we want to be. So take a few moments and just pray and reflect. Jesus, those occasions in my life that you lead me to the desert, let me go wherever you want. I'm sure there's some who are in the midst of that desert. Just take a moment and pray and say, Jesus, reveal yourself to me here. Show yourself to me. Jesus, redeem this. Show yourself to me in the midst of the dryness, in the midst of the isolation and the desolation. Jesus, show yourself to me. In the midst of this, reveal your love to me. Let's pray. Jesus, your Holy Spirit leads us to this desert. Your Holy Spirit leads us to the desert, but your Holy Spirit does not abandon us to the desert. Fill us with your light and with your grace and with your love. 
Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would bless those people, that the desert is, is such a place that it feels like it's crushing them, feels like it's, it's causing them to die. Jesus, meet them in the midst of their desert. Let them know that it is a place of hope, that it can be a place of healing, that it can be a place of restoration. Lord, your Holy Spirit led the people to the desert and ministered to them. Ministered to them in the midst of their loneliness, in the midst of their fear, in the midst of their anxiety, in the midst of their temptation, Jesus. Make yourself known. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by, by the power of the wild goose, bring life in the midst of this desert. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, Spirit, come. 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 Spirit, come. Oh, 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 Spirit.